Cool. So I guess I must be getting inoculated because uh, today is the looser presentation and it wears me out too much. <laughs> I've just had such a hard time getting over the syntax, which is I know ironic because everyone complains about the erlang syntax and says that it's crap. <laughs> But once you get used to it, so it's hard to go back to something like Ruby or Elixir. Um, so this is a talk I've given a couple times, usually to people who've never encountered Erlang. So to some of you, there may be a lot of redundant information in here, hopefully not too much. Uh, the goal really is to capture, capture the philosophy. There are a lot of synergies in the way that Erlang is designed which makes it a, a very powerful tool. Um, it's not a general purpose language. Elixir is not a general purpose language. There are definitely use cases for which you would absolutely not use a Beam language. But for the use cases where it makes sense, it makes a lot of sense. And so I'm trying to capture that, capture that error. Um, so really, this is much less about syntax. So the fact you're going to be saying Erlang versus Elixir, don't worry about that. The real goal here is to talk about the semantics, the, the whys and wherefores. And honestly, if you're ever interested in Erlang syntax, maybe five minutes of teaching. There's really not much to it. Uh, the hard part of Erlang is the, the concepts, the philosophy, and if you're learning Elixir, you're already learning a lot of that anyway. So the fiction for this talk is that we're not talking about Erlang. We're talking about a theoretic language. Right? We're going to design a language for, from scratch. And I want to design this language with exactly one defensive programming construct. And it's going to be equal sign. And I will demonstrate that from this one defensive programming construct, you can tease out all everything that goes into a line from just an equal sign. So unlike most languages, this is not a simple assignment. This is an assertion of truth, and everything flows from that. What's wrong with this? It can never be true. Never it's true. not true, right? There's no value of x for which you can add one, and it's still be the same, right? If the equal sign is an assertion of truth, then this is false. Now, defensive programming in a lot of languages especially one particularly uh, buzzword-friendly language lately, looks like this. Okay. This is not what we're looking for. Right? This is a simplified example of defensive programming in Go. All right. I have no interest in languages that look like this, so you're going to hear a lot of biased propaganda in this. If you wanted a practical talk, the last talk was a good practical talk. This is not. This is propaganda, pure and simple. Right? This is not what we're looking for. This is the Erlang way of defensive programming. We've got, we establish a connection to a database, and we assert the truth of that we're getting back an OK atom, and we're getting back an atom example. And that's about as complicated as defensive programming gets in play. If something goes wrong, we're going to get back something else, and we're going to crash. In, a, in virtually every other language, assertions as we're familiar with them, are extra code, right? They're extra code you have to remember to add. And as importantly, you have to remember to turn them off later, right? Because assertions are going to crash your code, and in most languages, that's a bad thing. So you have to remember to add it. You have to make sure that the assertions bear some reality to the whatever it is that you were writing. And you have to remember to turn them off unless they're not actually useful when you really get them. So if we throw exceptions when we encounter a false assertion, what do we do with those exceptions? Okay. In our fictional language, we're not going to do anything. Right? Um, if you've ever written a job, which I imagine many of us have, how much of your code is catching exceptions, handling exceptions, try, catch, throw, all of those? Uh, there are Multiple problems with that. One is obviously it adds a lot to the amount of code that you have to write, hence the popularity of uh, code generation for Java. 
But worse, you can often silently catch and throw away exceptions that actually are important to deal with. Um, now, if we don't silently catch those exceptions, and if we don't actually deal with them, we get a crash, right? And in a monolithic application, that's bad, right? Application is an exception you don't want to deal with with a crash. It's bad things, right? Again, the worst alternative, though, is that you don't. You do catch it, but you don't do anything with it. And now you've got data corruption somewhere in your application. Good luck finding it. And data corruption spreads, right? Once you've got bad data somewhere, you might as well, you know, shut it down because you're never going to, you're never going to be able to contain that. So crashes hurt in most languages, but in Erlang, crashes aren't so bad. If you think about a word processor, let's imagine you're using Microsoft Word, and your spell checker goes bad. Someone, you know, C++, who knows what goes wrong, but something went wrong with your spell checker. If your spell, spell checker crashes while you're using Microsoft Word, and it immediately reboots and picks up where it left off, why do you care, right? You don't care, I mean, you could be using Microsoft Word, your spell checker could be crashing every 30 seconds and you would have no idea, and you wouldn't care about it, right? So if you're dealing with small pieces of the program that can silently restart, immediately come back up and pick up where they left off, you don't care how many crashes are in your code. It just simply doesn't matter. So, starting again with equal sign as defensive programming and taking the approach that we're not going to do watch for exceptions, we're going to let it crash. To achieve that, we need isolation. If it, something's going to crash, you need to make sure the rest of the system doesn't come down with it. You also need to make certain that the crash doesn't result in corruption somewhere else. You need supervision. You need something to restart your code. If your restart logic is embedded in the same code that you just established is correct <laughs> because something went wrong, you can't trust that, right? You need something outside of the code to say, you die, I'll start you back up with somebody else. Start you all over again. And you need a faster one. Again, Spelter, for example, it's only harmless if you don't notice it. You want, you want it to come back up. So, digression. Now, Elixir is fairly young. Erlang dates back mid 80s. Right? It's an old language. Back even before Erlang, there is a company most people have never heard of these days. It was swallowed into the HP monolith some time ago called Tandem Computers. And Tandem Computers was huge. They were big in ATM networks, financial services, distributed databases in the 70s and 80s. They wrote a white paper called Why Do Computers Stop and What Can Be Done About It? This is what they said 30 years ago. Right? You want hardware modules, hardware, we're talking hardware, this is not software, this is hardware. Hardware modules, you want fail fast modules. If they're not doing the right thing, shut them down, bring out the spare. You want to, to do that, you want to be able to detect your module faults quickly, again, so you don't get data corruption spreading through the hardware. And you want those extra modules for rapid failure. Okay. He, Jim Burrow, who wrote this paper, asserted that with this, as a hard virtue of hardware, you could have a mean time between failure of decades. Right? When was the last time you heard a computer running for decades? Yeah. Maybe a mainframe. Um, but obviously, our laptops and, and desktops do not generally apply to that. The frustrating part is. This is 30 years ago, right? We've known for 30 years how to build hardware that works. We've known for that long how to build software that works. It's just that nobody actually does it. Jim also talked about their version of software. And it's unsurprisingly mirrors what they do with hardware. Uh, processes that fail fast, and their processes are ready to assume their responsibility. They had 4 million lines of code. They had estimated several thousand months based on you know, code analysis and previous experience. Their mean time between failure for their software was 50 years. Again, we've known how to write reliable software for 30 years, just nobody does it. I mean, when was the last time you heard about a Windows box that could go for 50 years without a reboot or a crash? 
Apple does, certainly doesn't write software that way. Tanner and Erickson both came to the <laughs> same conclusion. Bugs are unavoidable. There will always be bugs. Okay? We're, getting, we're getting pretty sophisticated with software proofs and languages to support that, but until we reach that nirvana, bugs are unavoidable. Hardware breaks, and perhaps most of all, operators are found, which is a big incentive for the, you know, the recent trends in automated automating operations as much as you can, deploying systems using the same template, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We're trying to minimize that. But the fact remains, operators make mistakes. Data center operators make mistakes and then back to your systems, right? Joe Armstrong, one of the off original creators of the Erlang language and the VM that we rely on. Talk, likes to talk about telco switch hardware, which is where all this came from, right? Erlang came out of Ericsson's telco switches. Downtime in that space, they get penalized. Greater than a few minutes of downtime a year, unplanned downtime. Massive financial penalties, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this was, again, 20, 30 years ago. I can't imagine what's like that. They needed to be able to write robust software, and so they came up with it. So, we came up with this list earlier. I'm going to add a couple items. Network transparency, explicit state management. We'll talk about all these. So, isolation. Crashable abstraction in Erlang is a process, just like it is in Elixir. Other processes can be killed if they're closely related, otherwise other processes don't care. They just keep running. Vital, no shared memory. There are ways to bypass this in Erlang and Elixir, but if you can at all avoid it, no shared memory. Which means messaging. We send messages to other processes. And because we want isolation, we want asynchronous messaging. We don't want to be intricately tied to another process. We just want to send a message and hope we'll get something back. Supervision. Processes crash, someone else starts it back up. We already talked about the fact that we don't want the code that's failing to be responsible for restarting itself. And the nice thing about supervisors in the airline world is that very, very simple code. There's really nothing that can go wrong with that code because it's designed to be as simple as possible. Fast food. Anyone guess what this is? This is a .NET thread, 64-bit platform, 4 megabytes. 32-bit .NET thread, 1 megabyte. 64-bit JVM thread on Linux, 256K. 32-bit JVM thread, 128K. And that tiny little speck at the end is an early process. It's just over a K of memory. So not only is this fast reboot, because you know, how long does it take to refresh a K of memory instead of a new process, but it's a massive agility benefit. I mean, the, the, the buzzword around Elixir a lot is Phoenix, right? Phoenix is bloody fast. If you need to spin up 10,000 of these tiny little processes to handle very healthy connections, that's fine. Spin up 10,000 processes. Right? There's virtually no work in these things. And if one crashes, who cares? You've got 9,999 more elsewhere. Network transparency. So, I mentioned asynchronous network earlier. Again, back 20, 30 years ago, there were a lot of attempts at making network communications transparent to the developer. Um, actually, I guess I should say opaque to the developer. The idea was you never had to care about it. things were just work. RBC, Corbin, right? The whole the whole fiction behind those ideas was we could make these look like just function calls or object-oriented uh, messages, and the developer never has to know the fact that that call is across the network to another computer somewhere else on the local network or another computer somewhere else across the internet. Um, so it's not like that as well. Trying to come up with this remote invocation that uh, it's a synchronous remote invocation that the developer has to, that doesn't have to know anything about. It. And the fact of the matter is, it just was never a great idea. Developers need to know about it because networks suck. Right? I mean, you always have higher latency, you always have the possibility of failures. When you're 
working on a local machine, if a CPU crashes, pretty typically the machine is down. So your software doesn't have to care about what happens when a CPU crashes because the box is dead. You have to care a lot in a distributed system. If you, you are communicating with an application on another box and that box goes away, that's a whole different failure space. Right? So local programming is easy. F local function calls are easy. Network function calls are a whole different beast, and they're a lot harder. And when they're synchronous, and you're just treating them like they're a local function call, all kinds of things go wrong that you never have to worry about when your program gets a local machine. So as it turns out, this messaging mechanism that the Erlang creators designed for telco switches, this asynchronous, fire off a message and hope you get a response, turns out it works great for network for and network systems for distributed systems. So if you ever want to know why functional programmers are so scornful of object-oriented programmers, sorry, I shouldn't say scornful of programmers, I should say scornful of the programming languages that object-oriented programmers have embraced. Um, you will almost always hear the word state. And I never understood what the hell functional programmers were mad about when they talked about state, but now I get it. Right? In an object-oriented system, in a Java application C++, State is this amorphous, nebulous concept. It's basically a combination of private, protected, public variables across all your objects at any given point in time. Right? There's no way to point to a Java application and say, this is my state right now, because it's constantly changing and it's not in any way constrained inside your system. It's just the whole thing as one massive jigsaw. With functional programming, and specifically with Erlang, state is explicit, it's inspectable, and it's really easy to get a test. Right? You can always take a look at your state and run some tests against it. You can log on to the Erlang VM and you can ask the process, what are you thinking right now? And that process will tell you what its state is. And that's such an amazingly powerful, powerful. Edge cases. So, coming back to this assertion of truth, uh, using equal sign, everything we developed from this. This is an email that uh, Mahesh Paulini Subrabanya, it's the best I can come to pronouncing his name, on Twitter, he's called Dies Way Too Fast. Uh, really smart guy. He sent this email on edge cases. I'm not going to read it to you, please read it. And he's definitely talking about pre early right? This is the software that he and his developers wrote before they encountered it. And you know, he's right. You get these, you can test all you want, but as we established earlier, there are going to be bugs, and things are going to come to find out. When Jim Gray wrote, again, going back to Tandem, he wrote about war bugs versus Heisen bugs. For those of you familiar with the history of, of the theory of atoms and quantum mechanics. More bugs are the ones that you can tease out with careful testing because they are predictable bugs. They are someone mishandling an off by one value or an array that falls off the end of the allocated memory. Those types of things are more bugs. They are in your code, they are findable if you look hard enough. Heisen bugs are the really weird ones. The Heisen bugs are the race conditions in a concurrent program. They are the harbor issues where your memory is suddenly you know, inconsistent. Uh, memory corruption problems, uh, network cards spitting out bad data, right? Those are the kinds of things that aren't in your code, right? They are, well, the race conditions are, but even then, they are extraordinarily hard to find. These are the highs and lows, and those are the ones that you really want to just let her like handle for you by, again, all these assertions. Truth, right? You could never get away with this if you didn't have nearly every single line of code or program asserting some truth about the state of your software. But because it is, you can rely on the language to catch the fact that something is not at all what you expected it to be and deal with it through supervision, through fast reviews, etc. etc. That's what this platform is designed to handle for you. So there are a lot of other interesting characteristics of Erlang that help with everything we've talked about. We've got OTP, which is Gen 
stage, right? Giant stage. Uh, really cool, by the way. Thank you. I, I, I really like that talk. Um, Giant stage is just another example of these OTP patterns. They are best practices for building systems that are built into the runtime itself, so that you don't have to think about it, which is a really powerful thing. Um, robust distributed applications, things like supervision. We have hot code limit and the rubber. So the first thing about Erlang, and I suspect that this will be true of Elixir 2, is hot code loading is the ability to uh, build applications that you can automatically upgrade in place. Nobody ever does that. It's just terrible. It's, it's virtually impossible to test. Do you do it? No, you, no, no. Yeah, I mean, just don't do it. Right? That kind of hot code loading is awesome that that's there for people who are running Swift hardware switches, it costs tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars in penalties. If you're down for more than a few minutes a year, fine. You know, hot code loading makes sense for you because you've got the resources to test that. For everybody else, forget about it. But you can still hot load code through the rubber, through the earth. And on their line VM, while you're inspecting the machine, you can discover, oh, that's the bug right there. You can load new code in place, fix it, fine, no problem. You probably want to restart at some point, but you know, that kind of hot code, hot code loading to address a specific need is actually really easy and really powerful. Garbage collection. Again, for anyone who's written any serious Java code, garbage collection is probably uh, a recurring nightmare. The Java VM historically has been a stop the world kind of garbage collection where everything comes to a pause where you go through and try to test try to clean up all that data. Um, when you've got thousands and thousands of you know tiny tiny processes, garbage collection is a not right? It just it happens all the time and you never know about it. We mentioned ATP, pattern management. Pattern management is awesome. Um, if anyone has explored other functional programming languages, pattern matching, pattern matching, maybe you found a good one. I've never seen pattern matching that is anywhere near as cool or as powerful as Erlang. Um, if you learn nothing else about Erlang or let's sort of look at pattern matching because it is just bloody fucking awesome. Um, when you're doing things, projects like Hacker Rank or, you know, uh, or is it, what's that? Rosalind or you know, any of those cool websites that allow you to basically explore new languages by solving simple problems. Pattern matching makes so many of those problems like five lines of code are done. Symbol symbolic debugging is amazing. Also, again, the ability to log on your running system, ask the process for its state. Not only do you see what its memory looks like, but you see it in the form of symbols that actually mean something to you. It's not an numeric error code, then you've got to go chase down your code and figure out what does 10354 actually mean. You use atoms, and you can see exactly, oh, this is in the state. Um, I don't care what my next data input is because I've reached this specific failure condition and I'm still running, but I don't care about my next name, right? You can actually have a state that looks like that. And you can see that when you're doing your debugging on the live system and you know exactly what's going on. So the key the key component that ties all this together is the Erlang virtual machine, which Elixir lives on, this like Erlang lives on, Jogsa, which is another attempt at a list of uh, style of Erlang. There have been, uh, there's, actually there is a link for the JVM, but that's a separate piece. Um, all the real languages are all running on the real meaning, what's called B. Now, Alan Kay said, people are really saw serious about software should make their own hardware. John's corollary, people are really serious about languages should make their own meaning. Right? All this works because we have a very opinionated, VM that doesn't take your bullshit, right? Doesn't have mutable data. What does that mean? Well, it means all the things we've been talking about in terms of the equal sign being assertion of truth. It means that you can design your platform very specifically around the features that you want and make everything that much more powerful. Um, Erlang has a lot of little features that individually are interesting. Um, some of them aren't generally seen outside of this ecosystem, but none of them are earth shattering individually. But when you throw them together, they make for a very opinionated, for a very powerful platform to help yourself. And that's it. How I learned to stop worrying when things fail. 
in summary, question your assumptions about software development. Be open to paradigm shifts. Better yet, create paradigm shifts. Uh, some resources. Learn to serve a You haven't seen it yet. It's a fantastic online book. Uh, this tiny URL address is a link to a gist of mine where I keep a long list of Erlang and Elixir resources, uh, primarily Erlang because I think I don't really care about Elixir, but anyway. Also, if you've not seen this talk, if you, especially if you've never seen Brett Victor, um, Brett Victor is uh, just a brilliant guy who's always thinking outside the box. This presentation uh, is a look at he basically transports himself back in time to the late 60s and says, what is the next 40 years of software development going to look like? And he talks about all these amazing advances that were happening in the late 60s in software development that have effectively languished for the last 40 years. Um, and it's actually a really depressing talk in a lot of ways, because you stop and think, if we had learned these lessons back then, where would we be now? Right? I mean, even Erlang, as powerful as Erlang is for distributed systems, the primitives that Erlang gives you are still bloody primitive. Right? There are a lot of hard to solve problems in network programming. That Erlang gives you better tools than anybody else for the most part, but they're still not nowhere near where they could be. It's really only with the rise of the really huge data sets, the massive systems of the last 15, 20 years or so, that we've really started to come to grips with the hard problems in computer science and we really started to tackle them seriously. But Tandem and Erickson, you look at academia, with what Liz and Lamport was studying 40 years ago, we knew how to tackle the easy problems in software development 40 years ago, we just didn't do it. And so people are still learning C, they're still learning Python, they're still learning Ruby, and still dealing with programming that's no more sophisticated than it was back then. Great talk. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Um, so it's clear that Erlang figured out a lot of this stuff 30 years ago, and yet you know new new versions of Erlang keep coming out. I recently upgraded to Erlang 19. What what is your opinion on you know what Erlang is continuing to develop? Is it just putting a finer point on a lot of this, or are there actual good stuff? Still so family good news questions. You know, basically, Erlang is 30 years old, but we still keep releasing. What are we fixing at this point? Um, a lot of it, there are a lot of things that modern developers take for, for granted that Erlang has not had maps. They have, they have one stunning example of it. For years, we had things that looked and acted sort of like maps, but weren't really. Um, so uh, maps are, are probably the most notable recent major feature. The, the key to understand about OTP, in which I suspect at some point Luxor is going to seriously consider forking the Erlang VM, is that Ericsson needs this stuff to work. And so they're very careful about what they add. Um, backwards compatibility is a huge issue. Uh, they can't just make it. They have made ill-advised choices. And speaking to someone who works at a a company that deals almost exclusively with Erlang, those ill-advised decisions can really hurt other people. Um, so they're, you know, they're very careful. Um, and when they're not careful, we want to know about it. But uh, so, so the advancements come fairly slowly uh, because of the caution. Um, I just I can't help but think at some point Alex is going to say, this is all just moving too slowly. Let's go ahead and fork it tomorrow. But yeah, you know, I don't know. It does have. It is a fairly robust platform as it exists. It's just getting new features into the VM takes a long time. Uh, anyway, so maps, uh, duty scheduler. So we, I mentioned scheduling earlier when you we were asking the question of, can we assume that in a if you have multiple stream processors, that they're all more or less in sync within a certain error range? And if you have exactly one processor per scheduler, mm, maybe. Um, but even then, the scheduler is also scheduling other things right now. Right? Uh, so there are always the risk that a, a one processor is going to get more time than another one, and one will race far ahead of the others. Anyway, so with regard to schedulers, one of the interesting features that's been slowly working its way in, again, out of abundance of caution, is something called dirty schedulers. 
Erlang doesn't have mutable data. Thus, if you're doing, uh, say, graphics programming or matrix manipulations or, in our case, interacting directly with the file system to store data, you often need to escape Erlang in order to do more powerful things or do lower level tasks than you can directly from VM. And those take the form of things like NIFs or core drivers, which are basically ways of uh, binding non erlang code into your VM. Scheduling becomes really tricky when the Erlang VM no longer has direct visibility into what it's running. Uh, it relies heavily on what are called reductions, which are basically a way of accounting for the amount of work that a process is doing. So when you have C code or C++ code or something else that's wedged into the VM somehow, it just doesn't have the ability to see what's going on. The scheduler doesn't has a harder time dealing with that. And you can actually run into something called scheduler collapse, which basically means because you have this opaque binary that's running um, code on your system directly, it takes too long and the scheduler doesn't know how to deal with that and you end up with just one scheduler running on your system and everything else just kind of grinds to a halt. It's a really ugly situation. Um, dirty schedulers are a way of basically uh, trying to make that smoother such that the Erlang VM doesn't get upset about the fact that a external process is taking too long. I really don't want to talk about the details, but that's another example of the type of things that are still working their way to the VM. No. I think like a lot of people, one of the big draws to early server early in this ecosystem was the currency. Um, and the more I've learned about it, although I'm still at the very beginning stages, it's more about all colors being first class citizen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm stuck working in Ruby. It makes me a little crazy uh, knowing that this is out there. Um, if we're stuck like that, what can we do to bring some of this stuff? Boy, I probably have to ask. Somebody. So the question was, if you're if you're stuck using a you know, language with its roots in the fifties and sixties that never really escaped that, uh, what do you do to bring some of these ideas into your own code? Um, so Ruby has a long-standing problem with concurrency that you know it basically doesn't have any. <laughs> And has that been solved yet? I mean, I, no, I, okay. They say it will be with three, but I'm not sure it will be yet. They're they're ditching threads and going to actors in three. Really? Yeah. Okay. So the actor model is becoming increasingly popular. I mean, not only do you have Erlang Elixir on the Erlang VM, but HackUp uh, is an attempt to bring the actor model to Scala and the Java VM. Um, there's a new language called Pony, Ponyland which is a compiled actor-based language, but it's not, I don't believe, functional. Uh, yeah. Is that right? Oh, that's right, I did not yeah. um, In fact, that, that ChinaWorld.com, I linked to every actor implementation I could find. It was open. open. This is for, strictly for free resources, so I linked all the open sources. I do remember acting on that. And there's Orleans, which is Microsoft's attempt to bring in something more like a like to uh, the Microsoft platform. Um, well, yes, if, I guess if actors are coming to Ruby, then maybe there's your answer. You just don't that they get that right. Uh, so is the actor the biggest piece? Well, so the, the actor model is, it's, it's actually funny because people tend to think that Erlang used the actor model, and they did, but they had no idea there was something called the actor model. Um, I can't remember the name of the paper boy, the author, who described the actor model back around the same time that uh, Erickson was, was facing some of these questions. To them, it just seemed intuitively obvious that if you needed this insanely high level of robustness, this was the only model that made sense to them. And, you know, yay for industry, happy to run parallel academia in that regard. Um, so the actor model is basically this concept of independent processing units sending messages back and forth. That's, I mean, there's obviously a lot more to it, but that's really what the actor model is, and that's where Lang is typically posited as an exemplar of the actor model in action. Um, which actually, incidentally, there's a, a lot of people trying to get Alan Kay to say that Erlang is the purest form of object-oriented programming. So Alan Kay, the guy who invented, effectively uh, popularized 
object oriented programming has often lamented the fact that OO programming has become much more about inheritance and class hierarchy, which to his mind has nothing to do with OO. It's just extra crap that no one should have to deal with. But anyway, um, again, this is propaganda, right? Uh, where, where was I going? Oh, oh, Act Model. So, Act Model is a lot of this, but again, a lot of the things that I've talked about here are dependent on immutable data. Um, they're dependent on symbolic debugging, which I suppose perhaps is, is possible with, with Ruby with its symbols. Um, but in any case, there's a lot more to it than just the actor model. The actor model gives you the network transparency, uh, you know, certainly easier concurrency to reason about than threads. Threads are just a nightmare. But you only, you know, lose five percent of the airline story. I mean, it's a, it's a key component, but there's so much more. Um, but it's a piece for those of us who are. Yeah, it's it's something. It's, it's scraps from the table. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mentioned pattern matching earlier. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't. The pattern matching is just so amazing because not only are you, not only are you not tied to this horrendous if else true hierarchy that usually are, but uh, pattern matching also means not only are you, are you processing your state explicitly and giving yourself different branches with a much cleaner structure, but you can also assign values in the middle of your pattern match, which just is a, it's an amazing practical tool, and I don't know of any other language that comes close in terms of that, and you just, what can you do, right? You can't, you can't retrofit that onto your Ruby environment. So there's just, there, I, I don't know. <laughs> Learn a mixer and find a new job. <laughs> uh, the nice thing is, there are two uh, big data conceptually, forget whatever you think of as big data, but conceptually it's notion that we have these massive, massive systems, massive data sets. Um, increasingly, functional programming is recognized as one of the few sane ways to cope with these environments. So people who are dealing with massive problems tend to fall back to functional programming concepts. So the number of jobs that are looking for functional programmers is just only going to go up. I mean, we've, it's taken us four years, but we finally got to the point where functional programming is no longer this academic interest of you know very little industrial application. Uh, functional programming is all. So there is hope. Um, learn it, get out of there, and find some place that needs it. <laughs> or import it into your environment, you know, find some way to, to persuade them that you know, because Ruby is so bad at so many things that, that need to be done these days, and it sort of kind of sort of looks like Ruby, maybe you should check it out. You know? Start pop, you know, uh, propagandizing your, uh, your co workers and your managers. I've started. I'm very careful. Sorry, Steve. I'll invite them here. I can hear you. We'll, we'll help you propagate that. Excellent. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thanks. Great. Thanks again,